Hey everybody, welcome back to Halcyon Days, the estate selling journey beyond. Um, very happy to be here. Another great day for a podcast. I'm here with Josh, like always. How are you, Josh? I'm great, George. I'm great. <laughs> it's very good. And we're also accompanied by Delinda Harper. Uh, she's a, an amazing realtor. Very happy to have her as our first guest. How are you, Delinda? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. Appreciate thanks it. For your, thanks for your patience with us this morning. It's been fun. Oh, it's all good. Tell us a little bit about yourself before we get rolling. Sure. Hey, George, I'm Delinda Harper. I'm a realtor, Coldwell Banker, um, Realty in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. I serve all of Central Pennsylvania. Um, I lived in Central Pennsylvania my entire life, um, so I know the area extremely well. Therefore, you know, I feel super comfortable working in um, all the areas. I work in York. Um, I've worked in Lancaster on occasion, Cumberland County, Dauphin County, Perry County. So my specialty is serving the 55 plus clientele, which I absolutely love. So, um, you know, work with anyone of any age, obviously, but, you know, my specialty and my passion is working with people that are like 55 and beyond. Perfect for what we do, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. So, if, uh, so what what uh, made that like your kind of interest is that specific market? Was there something that happened or was there a specific client that like that you met with that kind of changed your perspective on realty to kind of go towards that direction? That's actually a really good question. So as I've worked with seniors over the years, um, just love it. Like, you know, it's it's that whole saying about, you know, like wisdom, you know, as you get older. And I find when I work with those clients, um, you just you kind of really get to know them because it takes a lot of patience. Um, but, you know, so I was looking at rebranding my business last year. I met with a marketing person. We had a very long conversation. And in talking with her, she asked me if I ever thought about the 55 plus market. So I, I think just in my conversations, she clearly saw that I have a passion for that. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I just love it. And it's interesting. I, I learned in talking to a first time home buyer recently, like, the markets I love are like first time home buyers and then seniors. And what I realized, I think it is um, to kind of answer your question, Josh, why I gravitate to that is that I love teaching them. So first time home buyers, right? There's so much to learn. One of the reasons I love that is I feel like there are so many things I wish my realtor would have told me when I bought my first home. And then with seniors too, it may sound funny because a lot of them have owned a home for like decades, right? But a lot of them, you know, A, you don't do it very often and B, it's such a different change. There's such an emotional part to it. And um, they need so many more referrals to, you know, movers, you know, where a young person might, you know, they're gonna run a U-Haul. Uh, you know, when we get older, like we're not doing that anymore. So they need <laughs> so many resources like movers, you guys, yeah. organizers, stagers. So I think it's what makes me gravitate towards that is just the, um, you know, educating them and having that compassion and hearing their stories. I don't know. I just love it. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Well, so we're gonna, we're, oh, we're, 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 no, 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 no. I got, I got some questions, George. Uh, so <laughs> you mentioned like the difference between a first time home buyer and, you know, obviously the clientele you work with. Is there like one piece, but there was one piece of advice you give a first time homeowner just real quick, you know, uh, what would that one piece of advice be? I'm going to make it a long piece because it's hard to pick one. <laughs> so I'm going to kind of make it like, so I think, um, so one thing I wish my realtor would have told me is, you know, don't, don't buy it for the looks, right? A lot mm -hmm. of first time home buyers, right? They want to live in the house that their parents have. They want everything to be perfect. They want the granite countertops. They want the updated bathroom. And, you know, a lot of first time home buyers, you can't afford that. So mm -hmm. any house you get into, you guys know your homeowners, you're going to make repairs, right? You're going to do things, you're going to mm -hmm. change things. So I guess my best advice to a first time home buyer would be buy a house that you can grow into that is going to be enough space for you, your, your family now, your family, your space you need in the future. And don't look more at the house and the layout of it. And you know, that rather than, is it perfect? Um, okay. Because you know, your, your life is going to change very quickly. And those, you know, first from 20 to 30, 30 to 40, it's going to change very fast. So um, my advice would be don't go for that perfect home, go for one. 
And another reason I say that, sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but another reason I say that this is so important is that um, you want a home, in my opinion, as a first time home buyer, that you can build equity to buy your next home, right? So yep. if it's perfect, you know, There's you're more limited. Equity. Yeah, you're limited to appreciation, where if you buy a home that needs some work, you know, you, in addition to appreciation, you have a way to build equity to take that money and roll it into the next home. <laughs> So okay. might've been a long answer, but that's no, really- That was a great of, answer. Great answer. Right. That's uh, a lot and of then home buyers. The next question I asked, so you had met with like a marketing specialist. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had some marketing specialists like reach out to us, try to, try to meet with us, but sure. they kind of pushed you towards the 55 plus like community, right? Is there a specific reason beyond just your passion that they pushed you towards that way? Was it like there's just not a lot of people in that space? Is it just that there's not a lot of great people in that space? Like what uh, was there like a specific reason beyond just passion that they kind of like convinced really you to go question, into that Josh. <laughs> This is great. So um, I think it was a combination. One is the marketing people. So I met with an independent marketing person that I'm paying for. And then Coldwell Bankers, a marketing person, I ran it all by. They thought it was great. So basically, I think the big thing is um, most, and I would say most realtors don't do a niche, right? They're worried about it because, and I've had people ask me, like um, not consumers, but other agents ask me, aren't you worried about pigeonholing yourself that nobody else wants to work with you? And that's not the case, you know? An example I use is like my hairstylist. I have super curly hair and she is a curly hair specialist, but it doesn't mean she only cuts people's hair that have curly hair, right? You're going to work with yeah. whoever. It's just, that's what you specialize in. So she really felt like, and our marketing people internally will tell you, so many realtors will not niche because they're worried about, um, you know, minimizing who they're going to be able to work with. So doing a niche was definitely key. Definitely the number one thing she recommended. And I can tell you it, I can tell already, like it's paying off tenfold, a hundredfold. It definitely yeah. the need. The other thing is nobody's doing it in the 55 market. Nobody is saying specifically, I want to work with you. I want to help you. I want to help you in these specific scenarios as we get older. Um, so I think it was a combination of those things, um, having that passion. The big thing was like, okay, let's niche. And then the second thing was, um, I think she saw that in me. And then my response was absolutely, I love that. And then um, just knowing that, you know, no one's doing that and we're an aging population. So there's a need yeah. for it. Yeah, absolutely. So now that being said, like you talk about like it being your specialty. So if say someone like myself would come and reach out to you, is that someone like, would I, would you still assist me with buying a house or would you recommend a, like a, another person to me to help me buy a house? Yep. So I would definitely work with you. You know, I'm okay. not um, only working with 55 plus clients. Um, a lot of my clients, you know, when I work with them, I give them my business card on one side, it does reference the 55 plus. I've had so many of them say, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to give this to my parents, you know? So mm -hmm. definitely, um, you know, I'm able to help you just as much as I'm able to help a first time home buyer or a senior. Um, it's just that for me, kind Your of specialty. who I'm targeting my marketing to, who my ideal, I guess I want to say client is, is that 55 plus base. Um, now that being said, if it ever happens that for some reason, you know, I don't feel I could help you. It's more likely going to be, um, you know, maybe you're, I have my license in Pennsylvania, but maybe you're moving to an area of Pennsylvania that I could absolutely drive to, but you're buying. And I just, I don't know that I can really give you value and understanding that market. I might refer you to someone in that context. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, like I think the knee, the niching, the niching, um, advice, I think that's pretty like common advice for anyone starting a business, right? When you try to go too broad, uh, you can become overwhelmed. And I, I can definitely see how like niching down in like the senior, um, it gives you a, 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 the ability to show specific empathy and caring that maybe the average realtor couldn't because they're dealing with a wide range of ages, right? 
Whereas when you are working with that type of clientele, you kind of, for the most part, you I know you can't always know what to expect, but you kind of have an idea of like what each and every customer or client's going to bring you. So I think that was uh, that was really uh, some good good feedback there. Thanks. Um, you know, so, I think you're right in that since I started focusing, um, my my drive is so clear, right? So even in documents, brochures, I'm making flyers to give to my yeah. clients. You know, it is also, you know, I have a clear cut um, mission now, I guess I want to say. So yeah. it's actually helped Focused. a lot. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I so, have to say something funny. I love that you say niche because that's what I say. And <laughs> so many people say niche. So, you know, is it niche? Is it niche? Is I was going to ask. I was going to ask, like, not because I was correcting you, just because, like, I am terrible at pronouncing words. Mm. Like, I'm absolute worst. So I was not I was not correcting you. I was like, I, I, no. I, don't. <laughs> I actually looked it up one time. That's so funny. And it, apparently it's proper to say it either way. Oh, so, okay. we're good. Good to know. All right. Sweet. Um, so, <laughs> so we'll get into some of like the, uh, the formal interview questions, sure. uh, since I'm already asking, I'll ask the first question and then George can ask the next. I know George is, the, George, I can see George like wanting to jump in. Like, like I'm, here uh, guys. I'm a spectator I'm, at this point. This is, this is great. So well, the first topic uh, that we're going to go into is going to be like the market trends in senior living. So what is the current real estate market trends for 55 plus? Um, so definitely 55 plus homes are in demand in central Pennsylvania. We're very much in a seller's market, right? So basically when you have six months worth of inventory, that's considered what we call a balanced market. If you had six plus to 12, that would be a buyer's market. Anything under six is a seller's market. We currently have like maybe one to not even two and pretty much all counties in central Pennsylvania. So we are still in a crazy um, seller's market. So um, as far as trends, builders are starting to recognize that uh, we need more 55 plus homes. So um, I know Garmin, for example, they have some 55 plus developments. Um, yeah. They have one called Sagebrook in Dover. Um, people love Amblebrook in Gettysburg. Um, of course, a lot of people know traditions of America. Um, so builders are slowly starting to recognize. And now that, you know, we kind of got past that uh, manufacturing hurdle after COVID, there's a lot of building happening now. Um, so they are definitely recognizing the need for 55 plus homes. Um, I think the other thing I would say in relation to that is that um, so many seniors, I think, don't realize what their home is worth. Like we had those big jumps in appreciation in the last few years. And so many seniors are in their homes and they don't realize the equity they have that if they sold their home, they would have so much money to live on. Right. If they yeah. have been with family or even downsized. Um, and the one other thing I think I would say is I think so many people um from what I, you know, what I experience with clients is they think, you know, the 55 communities around here are all like 500,000 and up. And there definitely are those, right? Ample Brook is one. It's like 600 and up, you know? And, and those are more like the lifestyle communities, the ones, you know, like traditions of Ample Brook, where you have, you know, walking paths, you have groups, you have um, fitness centers, you have all those amenities and things. Yeah. But there are smaller ones too. Um, like there's a little one called Strawberry Court in Carlisle. Shippensburg actually has a ton of 55 plus uh, communities and housing. There was, um, there's actually at the Best Buy that George and I both worked at when we were in, in, um, in the be working for Best Buy, there was a, a 55 plus community right behind us. Yeah, um, there are so, so many. People don't realize how many there are. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the amenities then increase the cost of that area. Is it like, is it, so when it's like a community like that, do they own the homes or is it renting? Is it both? Like, how does that work? Yeah. So that's a, actually a really good question. And that's one of those things where I love to educate. So I always kind of explain this to people. So people think of like a condo, right? Like a high rise building in a city that that's a condo and you don't own the land, but there are other, if, 
there could be a single family home and there are, especially in the 55 plus community where you don't own the land, <clears throat> pardon me, you own the building and that's a condo. Um, okay. So it really can go either way. There is some where you own the land, but there's a homeowners association, right? Where, you know, they're taking all care of all that maintenance for the senior. Uh, but then there's also condos where you basically just own your building and the community owns the land jointly. So I would say at 55 plus, there, there's a range just like there is in the general housing population. Okay. it's good feedback. Good feedback. That's awesome. All right. Well, you mentioned uh, in that part of the process would be downsizing. You know, so I know when we, when we work with a lot of clients, downsizing is probably actually our most common thing. Okay. Um, how do you deal with it? And what, what do you bring to the table when there's like not just the actual... I need a smaller house, like the emotional part of that, especially with the community that you're trying to assist with. There's a lot of, you know, you're, what you're walking away from. So how do you deal with that? You know, that is the hardest thing. And, you know, right away, I think of George, um, an open house I did recently where a couple came in and they've been considering moving for two years. And we, they stayed at that open house so long, just talking to me um, because they, it takes a long time to wrap your mind around leaving that home, whether it's, you know, you're in your 50s, 60s, and you're just kind of like empty nester and downsizing. In that situation, you're leaving a home where you raised your children where you have, you know, you might have lived there 10 plus 20 years and you have so many memories. Um, and, you know, when you're a senior, senior, um, you know, it's the emotions of thinking, okay, this might be my last home. You know, mm -hmm. I'm never going to buy a house again. So that's kind of what I love about it. It is so all of these moves are so emotional. Um, they're really hard for the people. So what you have to bring, what I have to bring is compassion, patience in a big way. Um, you can't be the type of realtor who's like, okay, I need to get this done so I can move on to the next sale. It's, it's patience. I talked to a client yesterday um, that I actually referred to you guys and um, they should be calling you, but they are, um, she is moving to an assisted living facility and her um, niece is helping her. And, you know, it's, she's having a really hard time and it's really just a lot of listening yeah. and not pushing and showing them that you'll be there, giving them information and ideas of how to do it in a way that's going to be easier for them. Like we talked about earlier with you guys, the movers, stagers. Um, so it's really just sharing a lot of information, being patient, not being pushy um, and being compassionate, I think are really keys to it. Yeah. It's definitely one of, I feel like the more like harder parts of our job is definitely like the emotional side of that, right? You know, unfortunately, like, you know, if someone were to pass and then they have to downsize there, we've definitely seen that emotional side of like having to start that process and think about like, what can I take? What do I have to leave behind? Right. Um, and you know, Josh, in talking to that client yesterday, <clears throat> sorry, she, um, they were talking about you know, they, they kind of get in the weeds a little bit and talk about like, okay, well, we have all these books. Should we just box those up to donate? And I'm like, no, don't get rid of anything mm -hmm. until, you know, they talk to you because, yeah. you know, there could be value in that and money that you can take, you know, to your next move. Never know. Right. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I think they get a little bit overwhelmed. Um, and that's, that's really what I wanted to say is that you're really in the heart of it. Like I'm having, um, these conversations with them, but they're smaller windows. You guys are there for hours Yes. while they're <laughs> deciding what they're getting rid of, what they're not getting rid of. And that's where personally, I see even the tears coming out, you know what yeah, I mean? Like absolutely. getting rid of things that, you know, were the kids or that they've had for a long time and they really want to take, but they can't. I just think your part it's of hard. it have to be so patient and compassionate, yeah. which is why I feel comfortable referring my clients to you. That's what I told them yesterday. Like these guys are not going to push you. They are so patient, so kind, so compassionate. You know, one of the first things, and this would be a question I would throw back to you guys. <clears throat> they asked me, well, you know, 
Aunt Jane doesn't have, you know, fine artwork. You saw this house, there are no antiques, but she's a beautiful home. You know, it's a small Cape Cod, but it's gorgeous hardwood floor. Mm -hmm. She has beautiful stuff. It's really well maintained. And, you know, for me, I need a little bit of help from you guys because I was like, how do I explain this to them? And I said, I just know from talking to you guys that, you know, that doesn't matter. Your everyday items have value and they're going to help you get the value out of them. So, you know, yeah. that's one thing. Like, what do I say to my clients when they're, you know, telling me, well, we don't have fine china, you know? Well, I would say that's actually, I, I was going to bring up, it's kind of a, a good question to ask for me right now, because I was going to talk about, you mentioned how, she didn't think that there was value in like those old books, right? Right. The, the, the value assignment really, the clients don't have any clue to be honest with you. They just don't like, because they have some stuff, some stuff that they overvalue because of their emotional belonging, like, you know, like attachment to it and all that other stuff. And then the other stuff that wasn't significant to them, like, Oh, those books, no one reads them or we all read them and they've been sitting there forever, you know, but they've only been sitting there forever for you. You know, like yeah. somebody else hasn't read yeah. them yet or whatever the case may be. You know, um, most of our of our sales, a, a vast majority of our sales are through the smaller things, you know. So these like, oh, we've, we've got antiques and like that kind of stuff. Yeah, they're nice. But the, the actual drivers of the sale are always the smaller things. People like to come in, dig through junk drawers. People like to come in and get, you know dishes or, or whatever the case may be. I mean, there's so many crazy things that, that they, that they want that have, that you would think have no value. Um, so to, to your point, honestly, just, you, there's not something that you can be like, this sells, this doesn't sell. Right. Yeah. The craziest of all crazy things. sell. I was listening to a podcast, um, not that long ago about another estate sale agent who said that she has a client or no, sorry, a customer who, buys dentures from her every time there's dentures so as crazy as that sounds there literally is a market for almost anything wow. so don't throw anything away like if you're if you're gonna go through the home and throw stuff away at least wait till after the sale that's right, one thing i will you, tell you them that i've learned from listening to your podcast i said don't throw anything away until you talk to them because yeah. i remember hearing one of your podcasts about the silverware drawers you know, uh, I don't know why that just struck me. I was like, okay, that makes sense. You know, people need that stuff. So that is definitely one thing I do say to them is don't throw anything away until you talk to Josh and George. Yeah. Yeah, our work is, is yeah. our work is always kind of tricky. Um, so if we ever find that like there's actual value and stuff, like we'll take it to like appraisers and stuff. But like we found where like, you know, oh, like mom and dad got this on an anniversary trip years and years ago. So it's not worth much, right? It's, it's more nostalgic, right? But like customers don't know like what happened to that artist after that trip, right? Like maybe they were a nobody at that time and then they became somebody, right? And like now that piece of art that, you know, was nostalgic value has actual monetary value. Uh, the same can be said about like anything in the house, right? Like we've had customers who when talking about china like there's not necessarily monetary value but it's the same set that their mom had and they broke a dish set right oh. so they'll pay that you know whatever that amount of money is to get that set because it it holds like a an emotional part Absolutely. right so it's not just china that's been sitting in a cabinet like you you don't know like it you know it, it might it might not sell it might sell you don't know how much it's going to sell for so they the, the, like value is in the eye of the beholder uh -huh. with a lot of things that we sell um knickknacks like one of the sales we i think we've talked about on the podcast there was there was like hundreds of roosters and we're like who, yeah. who yeah. collects yeah. this many roosters yeah. right like and we sold every rooster to like right. five right. people because other people collect roosters uh -huh. right so mm -hmm. you you never really know what is going to be like in any value in your house or your parents house or whatever um, and that's kind of what, what, where we come in and, and we find the value and we find is, is there a reason why this rooster collection is, is here, right? Like, is there value in it? Is there money? Right. Um, but, uh, back to like the downsizing thing. So I, I assume you deal with a lot of obviously 55 plus clients, mm -hmm. but how often do you get like, say like I, my parents were downsizing and I needed to help them downsize. So I contacted you. Like how often do you work with the children of people who are downsizing? 
so often that happens a lot that I'm dealing with family members, um, especially, you know, um, yeah, I mean, it definitely happens in downsizing, but um, it happens, you know, when you're dealing with an estate, sadly, right? So, you know, and that's some of the things you have to deal with is, you know, I had one sale last year that there were six siblings. Mm -hmm. And while only one, and you have to make sure you know, and that you have the death certificate, and you know, for definitively who the executor or executrix is. Um, but oh, so only one of them was the executrix. However, you know, she felt really obligated to consult the five other siblings every time she made a decision. And it went well. She was great. And luckily, um, you know, they all seem to, you know, get along pretty well and agree. But that can be challenging, you know. Especially to, if they don't. Right. To make sure they're all on the same page. And with real estate, it's really deadline driven, especially once the house goes under contract. So um, it's. So I thought I had my phone. Um, it is um, really key to um, make sure you have those conversations on the front end. Like anytime there's more than one person, I'm talking to them on the front end about, um, you know, who's making the decisions and do you have to consult with other people? So like in your situation, Josh, my first question to you would be, okay, who's the decision maker? Um, mm. Do you have the power of attorney for your parents? And for whatever reason, the answer might be yes. So if that's the case, sometimes they'll say, Josh has the power of attorney, but we all three want to be involved in the process of making decisions. Um, so we, I deal with children, nieces, nephews, all kinds of people all the time. Um, where, you know, the seniors are getting help from them and either making the decision or just doing it all for them. Okay. Um, so I guess that, that, that was a great answer. I really appreciate it. Um, we'll get into the next question. Now you might need to provide some background for maybe some people who don't know real estate terms, but the next question we oh. have uh, for you is, so like nav it, the topic is navigating probate real estate. So if you could discuss some of the unique challenges and considerations when dealing with probate and in, in real estate, and uh, especially when it comes to like the senior side of the business. Yeah. So the first part is what it, for the, those who aren't, you know, realtors or, 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 or savvy with that type of term, what is, what is probate? So probate basically means that someone has passed away and that um, the sale is being done through an estate. So um, when it's in probate, the um, estate attorney is usually involved in handling it. Um, so essentially, in a nutshell, that's in general terms what probate means. Okay. So with a probate sale, go ahead. You have a question. No, no, no. no. I just I was going to really ask the question because I know I, I know I asked it all at once. Uh, so what are some of the challenges with that? Yeah, so the challenges are um, kind of what I just touched on, like having multiple people involved, yeah. um, always going back to the emotions, you know, and, and that's that's one thing you really have to be in tune to, too. You always think closing day, right? When you close on the mm. house, the seller meet and the deed is transferred. Like often, like most of the time, that's a day of celebration, right? And that's really how I like to treat it, you know? There's gifts, there's sometimes a bottle of wine, champagne, it's a celebration. Um, but it's really challenging when you get to closing with an estate sale because you have to balance the buyer is so excited, right? They're buying their home and, you know, the seller might be in tears. That's their childhood home. Yeah, yeah they, they're, they really struggle. Um, so one of the things is just being in tune to that. Um, you can arrange, and this is what I typically always offer, is that they can arrange to sign ahead of time. So they don't have to be there that day. They don't have to go through that and see that somebody else is going to be taking over mom and dad's home. Um, yeah, so there's just there's just so many things you have to be aware of. You have to make sure, like I said, you know who's the executor, executrix. You have to have a copy of, a copy of the death certificate. Um in that, it does not have to be an original, but you need a copy of the death certificate. Um, you also want to know and ask questions about their estate attorney, who they're dealing with, um, and what that estate um, 
I guess I want to say package or fee looks like, because uh, from what I understand, a lot of the state attorneys, it's almost like a, a package billing, right? So okay. where in a typical sale, the seller is going to pay anywhere from $150 to $200 for the new deed preparation. But you want a realtor who um, really has a good understanding of all this because very likely you're paying for that new deed preparation through your estate attorney. So, you know, I'll tell them, hey, go talk to the estate attorney or I'll call them because we may be able to tell the title company take this fee off. Um, okay. We have to take care of that. So, so you're not double paying. Right, exactly. Um, so there's just really a lot to know and understand. And that's kind of why I went back and got my broker's license, you know. So having my broker's license, I could go and I could open my own brokerage. I don't plan to do that. I don't necessarily have a desire to do that. It's just for me, you know, I'm a little bit nerdy and <laughs> I like to learn and I want to be an expert for my clients. And there are so yeah. many situations just like estates where you have to know it a lot. You have to know, you know little bit of you know dipping your toes into knowing legal stuff knowing when do i need to refer them back to their attorney back to their cpa about you know inheritance taxes there's there's mm -hmm. really a lot and there are times that i've gone and i've asked like who are you dealing with oh i'm just doing it myself that makes me nervous because there is mm -hmm. so much um that they need that to you know don't, yeah yeah, especially for the transfer of real estate. So I usually always refer them that, hey, you really need to talk to an estate attorney. Okay. Well, you're building these relationships with your customers, right? And they trust you implicitly. You know, that's you uh, just knowing you from the time I've known you, you bring that value that's not just you know, like, this is my expertise. So in, in that, with these conversations and all the stuff that they're dealing with, how many times are they, or how often do you get the conversation that's like maybe they're asking for advice something like that outside of like specific to the sale like are they bringing up like other things that they're dealing with like because of like like when you're dealing with like a probate or you know the estate issue do you, do you get that from from your clients so many times so often absolutely and thank you for saying that because that is the one thing um, that when my clients say that to me, it's the one thing that I take as such a compliment when they say, we trust you, we trust mm -hmm. you to, you know, give us recommendations, tell us this, we trust you. Um, that is such a huge compliment. So thank you for saying that. Um, they do. I mean, I've had them. You know, sometimes in conversation, I'll mention, you know, oh, my mom passed away a few years ago. I understand how hard it is. And then, you know, they'll ask me questions getting into the, you know, into it a little bit as far as, you know, well, how, how are you and your siblings now? Because it's such a hard yeah. process. You know, they definitely ask for refer referrals. Is Josh cracking up? Oh, I thought you were laughing. You put your head down. I thought you were laughing. Sorry. No, um, I'm still getting over a cold. So I, my oh, nose is sorry. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's okay. If you have siblings, that's like it can make you laugh. That's why I thought. Um, so, yeah, they do. yeah, it's just it, they have so many different questions come up, and they're definitely always looking for referrals, sometimes way, even way outside real estate, you know? Yeah. They're always looking for help in every regard. And that's where I say, like, you have to be patient because you mm -hmm. can't be sit and kind, like good hearted. Right. You can't be sitting there thinking, OK, really not making any money right now. This has nothing to do with selling the house because you're yeah. going to get into those things. And that's where you have to care about the person. Like I have some, um, you know, in some of my marketing pieces out there, you know, somewhere I, I have the saying that. I don't just care about houses. I care about my clients. And that's so true. If you just mm -hmm. care about the houses, A, I would ask you not to get into real estate. And B, I would ask you, please don't work with seniors. Because um, honestly, that's how I feel about it. Like it takes that caring and compassion because George is going to talk to you about things that and ask you for suggestions and recommendations and advice for things that have nothing to do with, with any expertise you have in real estate, it's just you as a person, you know. It also, it also kind of just through the goodness of what you do, it, it's it's also a financial benefit, you know. Even though, even though that's not your motivation behind it, right? Like the fact that you can build these relationships with your clients and that they do trust you implicitly, 
that then you have the referrals from them, you know, and that that can bring on future clients and all that other stuff. And if you if you are just in the moment of the one sale, of wow. you know, the one house, and you get your money and walk away, and and you know, and they feel that, you know, that's sure that's a great one time thing, but wow. that that doesn't help you the next time somebody needs something and they don't and they say, you know what. No, I don't have any, I don't have any recommendations, you know, 100%. Uh, or, they, or they forget your name because you didn't build a, you know, like that kind of thing, you know, so 100%. I, think for me, I, do. I, I get a lot of referral business. Um, I can tell you, I, I, I did something last year. Like I reached back out to my past clients, you know, pretty routinely multiple times a year. And um, so the other year I was doing something, basically giving them, mailing them like an estimated value of their home because I knew my clients who had been in their home a long time when the prices jumped, they didn't have an idea. So send them this information. And it was really interesting to see everybody was in the home. I put them in per se. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No one used another realtor and move. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that because I try and keep in touch because you're right. It's, you know, from a financial business perspective, you're right. You know, those people are focused on one sale where you have the opportunity to get so many referrals. You know, I have this one one client and they're like in their 30s now. Um, and I know it's a couple more. At one point, a couple years ago, I tracked seven sales back to them. And I think I know for sure I had one last year that came from them. So I'm probably up to nine referrals and, and closings just from that one client. Um, so it makes all the difference in the world that you treat them kindly and, you know, you don't forget about them after this, after this sale, cause you're going to get referral business. Yeah. yeah. But you know, the biggest thing, and I would imagine it's probably the same for your business. Like I know you, I've heard you guys talk about having a mailing list and keeping in touch and not over connecting, but, you know, keeping people up to date on what's happening with your business. That's helpful to them, you know, giving value. And that's kind of where I try and bring it from. I'm not just calling you to ask, Hey, do you know anybody I'm calling to like offer something of value? Um, so I think, um, it's just important to, you know, keep that connection and really keep connected with people and, and, um, you know, giving them value. That's awesome. Yeah. I think having a, like that type of personal connection is, is obviously very smart. Like I know our realtor, we just, we're, we just celebrated our one year in our house. So our realtor sent us four or five things throughout the years, like nothing like major or important or anything like that. Like, I think like she like once sent a letter, like, you know, like, Hey, refer me if anyone's looking for whatever, but like, it's mostly just like, Hey, just an update on this or just an update on that. You know, like congratulations on like one year in the house. But I can see the value in that. Like, you know, she's definitely someone that we would consider using again in the future. And then if anyone ever asked, hey, do you know a realtor? Like, she she's here to find for you. Right. And that's exactly what yeah, kudos to her because that's what they should be doing. Um, there are statistics from the National Association of Realtors, and I don't have them off the top of my head, but it is such a small percentage of realtors. So most people at the closing table will say, if asked, would you use your realtor again? Most, you know, it's it's a high percentage that will say yes. Yeah. Um, and but yet when it comes to the turnover, they don't use them because they forgot their name. They don't even know yeah. who they are because they haven't heard from them in 10 years. So that keeping in touch, you know, for you guys um, with your clients, like you're doing, that's the best thing you can do is just, you know, keep in touch in a way that's adding value. Yeah. From time to time, you might ask for that referral, but it's like recently, you know, I was sending something to my past clients about um, home insurance rates going up. If your renewal is coming, mm -hmm. um, they're just going up so much. So kind of be prepared um, for my clients uh, that live in a certain area um, that, you know, has a number of homes with flood insurance, the area was offering some kind of discount. So I reached out to those particular clients to let them know. So anything you can do to reach back out, you know, like I know you guys are telling them, Hey, we have a sale coming up. I know you like these type of items, mm -hmm. you know, those are the things we need to do as small business owners to, um, show people we have value and keep those connections so that we do get the referrals. Yeah. Yeah. So now I know uh, we had some technical difficulties at the start. Um, we've had you f for about 40 minutes longer than we normally do. Are you good for us to keep going or? Um, yeah, I'm you, good. Whatever you guys need. Yep, just want to make sure. Yep. I'm here <laughs> for the show. Whatever, however much time you have is great. 
All right. Well, then, George, you want to get into the next question? Well, I think this might be the last one then, um, just because of the time and it relates to what we what we do. So what are your strategies um, for when you're talking with your clients about having a successful estate sale? Do you have any things that have worked for you in the past? You know, not besides like pricing that like we talked about earlier, like any any kind of advice that you give your clients? Um, so the biggest thing that um, I tell them is, you know, A, like we talked about earlier, don't get rid of anything. Um, because the one big thing for seniors is, you know, I, I try and stress to them, especially, you know, most seniors are on a fixed income. You know, some of them have, you know, even if you have, you know, money, you don't want to touch it, right? Because none of us know how long we're going to live. We might need that for medical expenses or whatever. So anything that, you know, keep it all, basically, anything might have value, like we talked about. Um, but then also the timing is huge. Um, so, you know, navigating when I meet with them, and oftentimes with seniors, I'm meeting with them a couple of times. It's just not a quick process like we talked about because of the emotions. Um, so I like to tell them about using an estate sale at meeting number one. And then often meeting number two, I have to tell them again. And phone call number three, I have to tell. Because with seniors, it's really wrapping your head around, even if it's just downsizing. It's like, okay, I'm really going to do this. I'm going to sell this big house, you know? Mm -hmm. So as much as I try and get them in on the front end, um, you know, that's the goal because timing is huge um, because we need time. I need you guys to come in and I need you to thin it, thin it out. Right. Cause when you're yeah. selling um, less is more, you know, you need space. It needs to look, you know, lived in and staged, but a little empty, you know, you don't want the closets jam packed. You want them to have some items in there, but look like, Oh, these closets are huge. There's still room. Um, so, you know, it really needs to be thinned out. So I need to have the timeline work that you guys come in, you know, you have your process of how much time you need to thin it out. Then there's that process of, okay, these items didn't, didn't sell, you know, the owner needs to get rid of those items. And then oftentimes I need time for a stager to come in. Yeah. Um, because the stager, especially if the home is dated, um, you know, if, you know, you just haven't made a lot of updates or whatever, if it's dated or it's a big home and there's only two of you living there now. So there's not a lot of stuff in certain rooms. You definitely staging I've seen to be so beneficial. I'm a huge advocate for that, especially in a dated home. It can help a buyer look past um, the fact that it's dated and help it feel like home. Yeah. Um, so I have an amazing stager that I use. She does a great job with that. And another thing um, I tell people is the stager can come in and they can use your items. You don't have to um, rent the furniture and, you know, all the art pieces and that. A stager can come in and they can use your items to um, spruce it up and just make it look a little bit more fresh and modern with their, you know, eye for design. Um, and then after that, George, um, then I need to arrange for the photographer. So mm. there is a whole process involved, um, you know, before I get the home onto the market. So the biggest piece of advice I give them and I try to get them to understand how key it is, is to connect with you guys on the front end, because having that timeline lined up, you know, that we can get to uh, market when they want to be on market. We really have to back that all up, you know, so that they have time, you know, to go through your process. Um, and I don't know that that's something we ever talked about. Like I know ideally you guys need as much time as you can get, but what would you say um, in a perfect estate sale? And I, I know it depends like how much stuff they have, but the average mm -hmm. home, how much of a window of time do you guys need? Probably, so if we have, our sales are typically Thursday through Saturday. So okay. if we can get in there by mid the week before, like maybe Wednesday, that's probably like the right, you know, the right amount of time. We've done it before where we've come in on the Monday and had the sale on the Thursday. You know, it's not that it can't be it's done, hard. but it's yeah, just yeah. difficult. If If we have the house to ourselves and there's nobody there, then it's a little easier. Um, yes. But if we're if we're working the entire time with with somebody at the house still there, then it makes it a Close lot harder. Yeah, I would my, imagine. My I, uh, 
I never even realized like that there was like a whole industry of stagers, right? Like it actually like, like that would be like very beneficial for like us. Like if you had two teams where one was kind of doing setup and one was doing sales. Uh That's actually a great idea because I've heard you guys talk about like your table height and stuff. And I love that you're thinking because your retail background, I love that you're thinking of the aesthetics of it. You know, mm-hmm. and um, oh, yeah, so it's so key. As you guys for, uh, grow, you could have like a team just for that. Like, right, like there's the, like when people are walking through a house and they're looking like there, there's definitely going to be those people who open up every cupboard, like cupboard, or open up every drawer, right? Uh-huh. But the average person isn't going to do that. One, it feels yeah. invasive, and two, it's just that there's just not enough time, right? Like if you're like trying to hit up ten sales and this is just one of your stops, like you're not going to go through every room and open up every door. True. Um, so staging stuff for us lets our clients and customers get visibility on what we're selling or what uh-huh. is sellable um, that from when we've gone to a state says that they just, they don't do right. Um, or there's, there's no setup and it's just kind of like selling the house as is uh-huh. or selling the stuff in the house as is. And like, it, it, it's, it makes it feel more shoppable for our clients and customers. I can yeah, totally I say that. You're and definitely that would make all the difference the person floor. walking in. It's just kind of feels chaotic. Yep. Yeah. And then like, even still, like what we'll do is like, add, like, so like at, at one of our, at our sale coming up, we have these like really cool glasses that we love sports, like sports, like drinkware. Yeah. And like, it, it's taking up a whole table, but what we'll do is as that sells, we'll move something on that table. Yeah. Right. right. Like, in an area that has less visibility, we'll move it out to that table or, you know, we'll move stuff around during a sale. If we feel like it's not working, we'll take it and we'll put it somewhere else and we'll put something that we like want to get like rid of or get through. We'll move in, in and out. Right. Still so that, yep, yeah. Yep. See, this is why basically what I say to them, George, is trust the experts, right? Whether I'm referring you to you guys, to the mover, to the stager, you know, me, you know, um, the financial planner or the estate attorney, you know, you really need to trust the experts is what I would tell your listeners, you know, because um, they're the people that do it every day. Right. And that's why you hired them. So, you know, trusting you to know the best way to do it, you know, ideally those homeowners should be kind of like backing off a little bit and letting you do your thing because you're the experts. Um, But then that's again, where the emotion comes in, right. You're selling their stuff and that's very personal. Yeah. Do you feel like your clients are aware of what estate sales actually are? Because I think part of our part of our struggle, at least in this area, is that a lot of people don't actually know what an estate sale is. They just think it's, like a, Hollywood it's a yard term. sale. Or if you say if you say estate sale, they think you're selling the house. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we have that happen a, a bit, you know, where I don't know if your clients because you're already at that stage. So they. um Maybe they already have an understanding of what it is. I'm not sure. Have you come in across that at all? So they don't um, know what it is. Um, that is interesting that they you've found people thinking the estate is the sale of the house. Mm-hmm. I guess I don't have I don't run into that because I'm there selling the house. <laughs> that you know would make I mean? sense. <laughs> um, but I do find I struggle to get them to understand what it is um, yeah. because I think also the term estate. You know, they're thinking, okay, that's for when someone dies. Yeah. You know? yep. And that's, so I that, really they think that's it. when they can, that's the only time they can have an estate sale is like, yeah. oh, but I'm still alive. I'm right. So. Yeah. Right. So I really, when I'm referring clients to you, really try to emphasize, like, sometimes to be honest with you, oh, you know, you might not love this, but sometimes I'll skip the estate part and, and say, you know, they do day sales. You know, so and and try and help them understand that, you know, they come into your house, you know, they organize your belongings, they find the value and they're taking care of this for you so that you don't have to, you know, take care of doing that. Um, And, you know, like we talked about the value, a lot of things may have value that you don't realize has value. And then they're taking the work off of your plate, which for, you know, my senior clients, even the 55 plus, right? like in the younger range of that, they're often still working. They have a lot on their plate. So if they can have you come in and take care of that for them, you know, that's, but I do struggle a little bit. I mean, it works and I get them there. Um, But I do feel like George, it's a conversation, you know, that they keep coming back and they'll say like a yard sale, like a garage sale. And I'm like, kind of, but different, 
you know. And well, I mean, simply put, it's it's the location of the sale, right? So garage sale takes place in your garage. Your yard sale takes place in your yard, right? The estate sale takes place inside the state, you know, and you can't say it's a house sale because that would be very confusing. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, it's just all of the, all of the things that you want to get rid of inside people are are welcomed in and, you know, that kind of thing. So I had a client, uh, not too long ago, asked me about, um, I did refer them to you. I don't know. I don't think they're, they're on that, you know, slow timeline to get there. So that might be an eventually one, but they asked me, Oh, could we just have them? They, Cause they said, Oh, they do it in the house. Cause they're still there. Yeah. And we had talked about what I tell my clients is, you know, you want to pack boxes, you want to start getting ready. That's fine either put them in the basement or put them in the garage, because if it's an unfinished basement or a garage, people know you're moving. They don't expect it to be perfect. Put those things there. So mm-hmm. we had talked about that. And that client said, well, could they just do the seal in the garage? And I said, I can imagine so. I said, but that's a question for them. And then I always circle back to, you're the experts. I really can't answer everything about your business, but they're so easy to talk to. Just pick up the phone and call. You know, yeah, but- we, we did have a, a potential client that reached out to us maybe two months ago that mm-hmm. was asking about it and uh, they did not. That's my cat. Sorry. Uh, she wouldn't leave me alone. But um, they they reached out and they asked about selling the items and not coming into the house because like the mother didn't want them in the house. Um, mm-hmm. But uh we ended up not doing it. They, they just, uh, they didn't feel comfortable having people come in and they wanted us to bring everything out to the yard, you yeah. know? And once you, once you do that, it, it's, it's just a yard yeah. sale and you're, you're not making anything like you would make in, in an estate sale because yard sale gives off the impression that they're just unwanted items, you know, just things that you've had your use for, you don't want them anymore. And a state sale, right. these are things, you know, these are things that are, pe- that are part of people's lives still, and they just, they have to separate them for whatever the circumstances are. One, downsizing, like we talked about, right? The other one is when there's loss, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and there, there's a myriad of other things. But, like, it's stuff that they still care about that people would still value. Because, again, they're everyday use items for the most part, you know? And they're not things that have just been sitting in a garage that you haven't used or didn't want and you were waiting for a yard sale. So, there, right. you know, there's more value in actually being in the home. That was really helpful because that gives me a lot to think about as far as how I explain it to the clients. Because it's, I love the idea of like these are items you're using every day and they still have value. So yeah. you should and, make some profit off of them for your next move. And in terms of like the it's it's kind of hard. Like the the question I would ask is like if when they're asking, can they just do it out of the garage? Like, can you fit your entire house into a garage? Ah. Right. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's the question, right? Yeah. Um, we can, we've, we've done it all at, at so many sales where we put all the items that are, that are going with them in one room and we shut that room off. Mm-hmm. Right. So none of the items going with them are, are um, accessible. Right. Okay. Or we'll put it in the, we'll put those items specifically like lined up on a wall in the garage. And yeah. We'll throw like a, a blanket, like not like, like a tarp, not a blanket, like yeah. a tarp over it. We'll rope it off. We'll put not for sale. Right. So like they right. have, like, it's clear that those items are not part of the sale. Um, right. and, they, and in order to get to them, like you have to like do multiple things that are an inconvenience. Right. And then we'll generally have a person sta- staged near that area to make sure people aren't going and looking through those items or, you know, trying to get into those boxes or into those rooms. Yeah. Um, to like like those generally that's when people are are downsizing um mm-hmm. it's easier to put everything into one room and then close that room off yeah right uh versus moving everything in the house into the garage right onto the yard right right that makes a lot of sense i feel like i learned a lot from you guys as far as how to you know really explain it to my clients so that they understand you know because I think there's definite value for, uh, you know, my client base in, in what you guys do, you know, so that helps me a little bit. Have you guys, do you have, or have you thought about doing like a brochure or some kind of handout, um, that like people like me, like your referral partners could have to pass along to our clients? We have, um, a brochure that we pass out. Um, oh. here's, it's actually near me. So, um, nice. it's, uh, trifold. I probably should have given you one of those when I met you, huh? 
That's but, okay. Um, all yeah, this good I would stuff. Love, I would love to have maybe, you know, a couple of those. If it's something I can just copy, even just one to have some hard copies. And then um, I can scan it or if you have it that I can email to people. Because um, yeah, a lot I, of times, like, I'll just I think we have that digitally right george that we could just email that to her i have to check i did it through vista print so i'm sure i have access to it okay yeah, yeah because cool. that would be really helpful because i know um i have some information from the stager from you know and that's one of the things when we talk josh about like um doing a niche niche helps you narrow down <laughs> your perspective you know what you need to do um yeah. so now i'm in the process of really kind of fine-tuning all my documents for this and that's one of the things i have on my list for this year is i really want to get together almost like a packet that i can give to my clients that has information on each of my you know affiliate professionals like you guys and you know other people that way i can just give them a packet of information that can be helpful resources absolutely yeah yeah we're also kind of like working on like building up a network of people that we can refer to because uh, I mean, we have so many clients who reach out to us, and it's just like that's just not what we do, right? Um, like we have the like we have the ability where we could be like a junk out company, but that's not that's not what we do, right? Like yeah. we, we we go into the house and we hold the sale in the house, and yeah. that's how we get you as the customer or client the most value for your items. Yep, and same thing. That's one of the resources I have too as a junk removal company. But yeah, you do. You have to have those resources because. You know, I don't know if it's happened to you, but it's happened to me where like they'll call about something, I'll, you know, give them something else. And then down the road, they might come back to you, yeah. you know, because you were helpful to them. I think we've we've gotten confused for a junk out company. And we had a client um, recently where they worked with us first and then they just had so much stuff that they ended up still having to get a junk out company. And the amount that they had to pay to the junk out company to come in and get the stuff uh -huh. was was significant was was more than what we had made them where that if they didn't work with us first they would have had to come out with serious serious money out of pocket wow this was out. the hoarder the hoarder house i mean wow. this was an extreme case right yeah, it was impossible to sell through that <laughs> that was just yeah. Like the junk you know, out the company. The only sale I ever turned down, uh, I shouldn't say that, but I think like really turned down was I went to, it was a past client's mom and I went there and it was so bad. Like I basically walked in and just stood. I, you yeah. couldn't move. And, you know, that was one of the hardest things is like telling her, like, I can't manage. We can't sell the house because it's a safety issue. Right. Like if people can't walk through, they can't see it. And there's a, you know, yeah. there's safety issues. Um, yeah. And I felt bad she cried. You know, I tried to be as gentle as I could, but, you know, that's a definite problem. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at that point, like you've said, there's not a lot of, at least that I'm aware of, estate sale companies in this area. Um, had I yeah. known you guys then, you would have been a great resource to help this woman because, you know, she needed money, which is why she needed to sell, but she had all this stuff, like, you know, just a vicious cycle. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, the easiest way to describe the difference between like us and like a junk out company is the junk out company you're paying to come in and remove your items, right? Yeah. There's no, there's no monetary value for you on the back end. It's, it's most like you're paying someone else, right? Yeah, totally if, they, if that company sees value in your stuff, they'll put it to the side and sell it on the back end and make their own profit, right? Whereas with what we do is we are selling your items on behalf of you and we take a percentage okay. of the profits. So you're right. still making money, right? Yeah. Like, like you're you're paying us for a service, but it's not out of your pocket. It's out of the the sale. Uh huh. Yeah. It's basically and you know, I love what you guys said too about the it's different than a yard sale. You were saying, George, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't think I've ever had this objection when I referred business to you guys, but it's a good point that you know, just like your hiring a mover because you no longer want to do a moving van yourself. Mm -hmm. You know. A, if you do a yard sale, you have to man it. You have to do all that yourself. And B, you're getting less money. Where if they hire mm -hmm. you guys, it's kind of the same thing. You know, you're at the point in your life now, pay somebody to do that. And, you know, they're they're going to get you more money than you would if you just did a yard sale. And yeah. more things will sell. You know, so you'll get more items out of the house. So less for you to worry about after that. And then yeah. 
every time someone's going through someone needs in state sales because they're leaving the home in some way or another, right? So like you you are obviously dealing whatever the circumstances are with way tougher things, way more emotionally difficult things, yes. so many other things like pass this burden on to to us mm-hmm. or any other whoever's listening, any other state sale company who who you know is going to do you right. Like pass that burden off because it's just not it's, it's not something you need to add to your plate. You know, it's just it's just a lot of work, especially when you're dealing with loss and you've got siblings who, like you said, they're all talking to each other, coordinating this. Like, there's no way to, or not no way. It's very difficult to get everybody on the same page, everybody to come help out, everybody to come pack up, put the stuff out on the yard, be there for the days of the sale. When things don't sell, have another sale. You know, like, it's just a lot to coordinate for people and it's just deal with the stuff that's actually, like, emotionally draining and let us do the right. stuff. Yeah. You know, you know I don't. I didn't know you guys then because I would have used your services when I moved. And that's why another reason I think the connection with 55, um, we actually rolled this out when I turned 55 on my birthday last August. Um, So I've gone through some of these things, like my mom passing away. And then I sold my family home where I raised my son. And I'm like, I'm a mama. I'm a mama bear. I'm a, you know what I mean? So like, I still had toys. I still had, you know, you put it down in the basement and you forget about it. And you're like, oh, I can't get rid of that. I remember when he played with that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll be honest, it was a nightmare going through all that stuff. Um, Just the emotion of it. It took me so much longer than it needed to. I ended up you know, junking a lot of it, things Mm -hmm. that I knew from what I do could have sold, but I needed to get back to my business. You know what I mean? So had I known you guys then, I absolutely would have hired you guys to do that. So, you know, and I love when I can say that to clients, like I would use them myself. I've used them, you know, because I definitely, um, something you said, George, made me look back and think, yeah, like that was a nightmare when I was having to do that. And it took me Mm -hmm. forever. So- You know, even when you're just selling that family home um, and you're still in that 55, you know, 65, 70, where you're still working to hire mm-hmm. somebody to take care of it. That's huge to me. There's definite value. Yeah. All right. I don't want to take any more of your time, but I do. I do want you to take a minute and just tell people um, because our banner is not working properly. Tell people how they sure. can get in contact with you, you know, like website, you know, social media, all that other good stuff. Okay, thank you. So again, Delinda Harper, um, a realtor associate broker with Coldwell Banker Realty. My office is in Camp Hill, um, but do, you know, Adams County, Lebanon County, uh, Cumberland, Dauphin, pretty much all central Pennsylvania. Um, You can reach me um, 717-350-0949. You can text me or call me. Um, My email is delinda, D-E-L-I-N-D-A, at realtor55plus.com. And that is also my website, www.realtor55plus.com. And thank you guys both for having me on today. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure, Delinda. It's been awesome. Thank you for your patience with us. I will put your information in the notes, um, and I'll put links on YouTube and stuff like that as well. Oh, that Uh, would be great. Thank you. People who are listening to us. Yep. So, so again, yeah, we we really appreciate you. Hopefully, we we have the opportunity to have you you back on. This has been great. Thanks. Thanks. It was great. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. And I feel like I learned a lot about, you know, more about your business. So I think it was a win-win all around. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Josh, send us off. (laughs) All right. Well, this has been uh, House Sound Days, the estate sale journey and beyond. Thanks for watching wherever you watch your podcasts, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, etc. We'll see you guys next week. Peace out. Cub Scout.